From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. The Republican presidential candidates, not named Donald Trump, squared off in their third debate on um, Wednesday night as the field narrows. What did we learn from that debate and who came out ahead? And does it even matter with Donald Trump having such a big lead in the polls? Plus, some more fallout from Tuesday's elections you probably haven't heard elsewhere. Welcome. I'm Paul Gigot with the Wall Street Journal editorial page, and I'm here with my esteemed colleagues, Kim Strassel and uh, Kyle Peterson. The debate in Miami, five people took the stage, Chris Christie, Tim Scott, Vivek Ramaswamy, Nikki Haley, and Ron DeSantis. Trump not there again, staging an alternative event with Arkansas Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders endorsing him. But the debate was the main event on Wednesday, and foreign policy dominated the discussion, especially on Ukraine and Israel, with uh, Vivek Ramaswamy being particularly vigorous in going after the idea of aid to Ukraine and Nikki going after any those who support that. Let's listen to Ramaswamy talk about Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, and the Nikki Haley responding to his comments. Ukraine is not a paragon of democracy. This is a country that has banned 11 opposition parties. It has consolidated all media into one state TV media arm. That's not democratic. It has threatened not to hold elections this year unless the U.S. forks over more money. That is not democratic. It has celebrated a Nazi in its ranks, the comedian in cargo pants, a man called Zelensky, doing it in their own ranks. That is not democratic. America can never be so arrogant to think we don't need friends. After 9-11, we needed a lot of friends. Now is the time to get partnerships. This unholy alliance between Russia, Ukraine, and China is real. There is a reason the Taiwanese want us to support the Ukrainians. It's because they know that China is coming after them next. There is a reason Ukrainians want us to support Israelis, because they know that if Iran wins, Russia wins. We have to see the combination of the three. Ambassador. I am telling you, Putin and President Xi are salivating at the thought that someone like that could become president. They would love to the see The fact that. of the matter is she doesn't answer So this the is what I will tell you. We're is, driving Russia of all, into China's hands. Ramaswamy. Well, there you go. That was a striking. Vivek Ramaswamy had said it before the last debate. He wanted to be the uniter. Uh, he was anything but uh, this week. He really came out, I think, as a full-throated isolationist. He even suggested that uh, Israel should kind of go it alone at least after some initial help from us in fighting Hamas and its enemies in the Middle East. And he's really, I mean, his his comments about Ukraine weren't simply that, well, it's not in our national interest to support it. It's, It's not worthy of our support. Yeah. If you wanted a distillation of full on America first agenda, which I agree with you, Paul, is isolationism. This was Vivek Ramaswamy. And, you know, in some ways it was good to hear because a lot of the people who are members of that movement tiptoe around a little bit. And in fact, he just laid it out there saying we need to focus entirely on our southern border. We can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Talked about some very concerning approaches he had, I think, to military funding. And it was a very good contrast to see on stage at this time of great peril uh, internationally, because you had the, the polar opposite, mostly vocalized in Nikki Haley, but also Chris Christie to a certain degree, who were making the very forceful opposite Reagan-like argument that we need to be playing a stronger role on the international scene and that that is indeed how we keep ourselves from getting further drawn into conflicts by exercising peace through strength. And again, I think that this international disasters that we've seen in Israel and Ukraine, they're horrible, but they are proving a moment of clarity and dividing people up on the stage and letting people see what the two very, I think, very important different routes are for a presidential leader. Ramaswamy even talked about uh, people who support aid for uh, Ukraine or elsewhere want a strong role in the world as bloodthirsty members of both parties who hunger for war and get rich off it, uh, Kyle. If you know any history, that's uh, right out of the 1930s when Republican isolationists were investigating American arms makers <laughs> and uh, opposing lend lease to Britain. And when uh, in the 19 19- 60s in the anti-war movement when uh, the left accused uh, American leaders of trying to pay off American arms makers. 
In the context of that specific remark where he mentioned those bloodthirsty members of both parties was he was saying we need to give up these wars so that we can shore up Social Security and the entitlement state here at home. I think it is the most forthright he has been on that issue so far. Uh, And if you add it all together, I mean, it's not only that, it's his his plan to make peace with Putin and the war in Ukraine, some sort of deal by giving Putin basically what he wants, building up U.S. semiconductor industry here at home so that in 2026 or 2028, we can give Taiwan over to China. That seems to be his deep worldview. And One thing that I think is notable, though, uh, I mean, there's always been this kind of strain in Republican politics is Nikki Haley pushes back hard against that and says that is America in decline. And she gets wild applause for it. And not only at this debate, similar things I've noted at, at previous debates. And it does suggest to me that there is a line of thinking that this sort of strain of uh, America at home, nation building at home, to pick a phrase you heard from the left in previous decades, there is a strain of thinking that that is rising on the Republican side of the aisle. And the response to Nikki Haley's pushback suggests that maybe not as much as Vivek Ramaswamy and some of his allies hope. Uh, Other candidates, Tim Scott and uh, Ron DeSantis, both didn't go anywhere near uh, Ramaswamy. In in degree, but they did hedge Kim on aid to Ukraine with uh, Ron DeSantis uh, using a bunch of uh, kind of caveats to support for Ukraine. One, well, we got to end this war. Well, everybody wants to do that. Another saying that Europe has to step up, but of course, Europe, uh, a lot of governments, particularly the smaller governments in Europe, are spending much more as a share of GDP than we are in in aiding. Ukraine. And it's clear he doesn't want to commit himself. And Tim Scott also hedged. And comparatively, all of them, with the exception of Ramaswamy, were forthright in saying they would support Israel. But I think my own view, I don't know if you agree with this, but it makes DeSantis and Scott look weaker than Haley on this. She has at least conviction. She states it. She's firm in it. And these guys are hedging. Couldn't agree more. That was the definition of leadership up on the stage. It would be very easy for her to try to hedge, too. She's not doing that. She's been very clear, very full-throated about what she wants. And that contrast, we've had it in past debates, but it was just so much more striking last night, Paul, in my mind, because she had just finished talking about her vision of the world and how she wants to reproject American strength on that world. And then the question goes to DeSantis. And as you said, he said, well, you know, we got to end this war. Well, has he spoken to Vladimir Putin about that? I mean, exactly how does he intend to do that? We would all love to end this war. And one point, by the way, that Haley made that I also thought was very striking and important. She noticed that noted that had Joe Biden been quicker off the mark to give Ukraine the supplies that it had asked for very early in this conflict, the likelihood that them deed that war might be over. But that's not what happened. So we're dealing with the consequences of that. So when Ron DeSantis says, oh, we'll just end this war. Well, what exactly is your plan, Governor? And then to your point, Europe must step up. Right now, we are, I believe the last time I looked, ninth in terms of support for Ukraine as a share of GDP after European countries. So that falls flat as well, too. And it's so clear that Ron DeSantis thinks that if he takes this middle position, that he's somehow chasing Trump voters. But as we've spoken about this before, those voters don't see anything other than the real deal in Donald Trump. Why are they going to go for Ron DeSantis? He'd be, in my mind, so much better off doing what Haley is doing, which is uh, speaking honestly about this and in a way that contrasts his vision with Donald Trump. And that's exactly why, by the way, you see her rising in the polls in both Iowa and New Hampshire and nationally. It's going to be interesting to see, Kyle, what impact the debate has on uh, the followings for DeSantis and Haley in particular, who are emerging as the two main alternatives potentially to Donald Trump, and whether the world events, the two wars and other uh, issues, including the uh, declining state of American weapon stocks and so on, is will it help Haley? Uh, I think it has so far. I think it will, although it'll be interesting. DeSantis did sound at least stronger when it came to China, I thought, uh, on Wednesday. He also did come out for uh, 355 ships 
target by the end of his first term. We've got about 290 now. And uh, Haley declined to actually give a specific number, says she couldn't because of the budget problems. And I think DeSantis gets the better of her on that on that point. I agree with that. And I, I don't think that Ron DeSantis is weak on rebuilding the U.S. military. I think he's pretty good on that. And as you say, has put out some pretty specific plans that are worth going and looking at. But I do think, to echo Kim, that his trying to have a foot in both camps here and go after those Trump voters is the wrong way to go. I think it is being the Me Too candidate. And I do think that the rising salience of foreign policy has really helped Nikki Haley in allowing her to play toward her strengths. She was a governor, and so she has a, a domestic record. She has domestic policy proposals that her campaign has put out. Uh, but I do think her biggest strength, particularly as a candidate up on the presidential debate stage, is that she knows some foreign policy. She spent a couple years as the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., and that is a place where often these governors fall short in, in previous presidential cycles. There are great examples, Scott Walker being one of a, a governor who has a great domestic record and gets up on stage and gets these foreign policy questions and just seems out of their depth. Uh, and Nikki Haley, I think, is proving that she is not out of her depth on this issue in a way that that it is allowing her to stand out on the stage among these candidates we have left. All right, let's turn to another issue, which is uh, abortion and uh, abortion being a uh, real Republican vulnerability these days. Politically, the uh, uh, results on Tuesday were disastrous for the anti-abortion cause with Ohio's referendum sweeping in a one of the most liberal abortion laws in the country now into its constitution didn't seem to help in Virginia. It seemed to help Democrats in Virginia races. They're basically, Democrats are running on two things these days. That's it. Every race, which is one, abortion rights, and two, fear and loathing Omega <laughs> and Donald Trump. Those are the pretty much all they talk about in these in these elections. So let's talk about the differences on abortion where you have uh, Tim Scott taking one position and Nikki Haley something else. I would certainly, as president of the United States, have a 15-week national limit. I would not allow states like California, Illinois, or New York to have abortion up until the day of birth. I certainly wouldn't allow, not allow for governors, uh, former governor, uh, Democrat governor of Virginia, who talked about infanticide. We need a 15-week federal limit Three out of four Americans agree with a 15-week limit. 47 out of 50 countries in Europe agree with a 15-week limit. I would challenge both Nikki and Ron to join me at a 15-week limit. I am unapologetically pro-life, not because the Republican Party tells me to be, but because my husband Michael was adopted and I had trouble having both of my children. So I'm surrounded by blessings. Having said that, when you look... Post row, a wrong was made right. They took it out of the hands of unelected justices and they put it in the hands of the people. And now we're seeing states vote. And what I'll tell you is, as much as I'm pro-life, I don't judge anyone for being pro-choice and I don't want them to judge me for being pro-life. So when we're looking at this, there are some states that are going more on the pro-life side. I welcome that. There are some states that are going more on the pro-choice side. I wish that wasn't the case, but the people decided. But when it comes to the federal law, which is what's being debated here, be honest. It's going to take 60 Senate votes, a majority of the House, and a president to sign it. So no, we haven't had 60 Senate votes in over 100 years. We might have 45 pro-life senators. So no Republican president can ban abortions any more than a Democrat president can ban these state laws. Kim? What do you make of that distinction? Tim Scott, the 15-week ban, that's the position taken by uh, Susan B. Anthony List and uh, most of the anti-abortion activists. But it doesn't seem to be a political winner right now. And Nikki Haley taking a different path. This is a consistently what she's been taking, the position on abortion since the start of her campaign. And at least if you look at the, the, the results in elections, she seems to have a better beat on the public mood on the question than others. I couldn't agree more. And I think that there would be great wisdom in a few people maybe taking a page out of Nikki Haley's book. The distinction you're seeing up there on stage is crucial because what Tim Scott 
was advocating is is very much again as you noted what national pro life groups and others have been promoting at, at a state by state basis and it's not working for republicans they're losing this referenda and you are seeing Democrats consistently beat up Republican candidates in states like Virginia. But elsewhere, we saw it so much in the midterm elections. And they're losing on the basis of being defined as abortion extremists, which they're not. It's the other side. That was something that DeSantis tried to, to point out up on stage. You know, the, the real radicals here are the other side. But it's these policy and tone distinctions that Nikki Haley is advocating that are really important. And part of it is she simply sounds reasonable in that it's true that for 50 years, uh, conservatives and pro-lifers attempted to overturn Roe so that these decisions could be returned to the state. And so there is something jarring to to a certain point where you have candidates now saying that the state should once again be removed from that equation with a federal legislation that will impose some sort of national limit, which is what Scott has been advocating. But what I really liked, Paul, was her comments about judging. I don't want to judge you. Don't judge me. This is a controversial issue, but there are many more places where we agree than where we disagree on placing more kids via adoption, on looking at some of the more extreme practices and, and saying that we're going to outline those rather than picking some date that is going to divide people. If you look at suburban voters, especially women voters who continue to, in recent years, move more Democrat, it's because increasingly when they hear people say, I'm pro life from the minute they open their mouth, they simply check those people as Republicans off the list of those that they're going to vote for. And Nikki Haley is advocating a different way for conservatives to talk about this issue. And it strikes me as one that certainly is going to resonate better, or at least has got a better shot of resonating than what the GOP has been doing up until now. Mm -hmm. 